the final humanities course in the world, breathes its last breath and students stop at attempting to, to take humanities degrees, the question we have to ask is who will cry? Who will be sad in a world in which is dominated by money, or in which is dominated by the dollar, when that last humanities course stops? And obviously this is somewhat hyperbolic, but the point is that humanities through the last 20, 30 years has seen a sharp downward trend to bawling on absolute irrelevance. And we think that that is something we, we absolutely should reject, and something that we should regret for the way in which that influences people's views, and the way in which it influences society more broadly. So I'm going to ask four questions in this speech. Firstly, what are the contextual points which are important to analyse in order to appraise this debate? Secondly, why is education important as a mechanism? And then thirdly, how this has devastated students and youth since the decline has, has started? And fourthly and importantly, how has this affected society more broadly? So firstly, on context. The first thing that I want to note is that this isn't been a downward trend which has been commensurate with more things coming in and humanity's maintaining its course. What I mean by that is it has been replaced to a sense of dominance and hegemony of economics degrees and law degrees and other more practical or perceived to be practical degrees which have taken that space to the exclusion of humanities. That's to say that certain things in society may have a value, but that is not a value which can be priced economically into the system of capitalism which has been entrenched throughout predominantly the West, but broadly humanity more broadly over the past 30 to 40 years, and therefore things which do not translate neatly into economic value have been excluded. And importantly, note the way in which this puts downward pressure on the way in which students select and choose what to study. That's to say that in a world in which the most important thing is making money, Things which are therefore deemed less important intuitively are things such as asking or answering questions such as why we are here and what we are meant to be doing in these lives as humans. And note that students across time broadly do have similar interests, therefore this is not a trend which has been reflective of people yeah. accessing some higher rationality to realise that maybe earning money is more important than answering the question of why humanity exists. It is just that the way in which society is structured forces and coerces the people into making that choice. But secondly, know that this is essentially a mirage or a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's to say that more people than ever are studying economics and law degrees, but the number of economics and legal jobs do not rise commensurately. But obviously the reason for that is structural, because obviously corporations have an incentive to have the most amount of people able to take up those jobs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will get jobs. So they have a perverse incentive to coerce you into doing or studying economics or law at the expense of humanities, which benefits them because the pool for them to choose from is larger, but doesn't necessarily translate to economic benefits for you. The third thing to note is that this is an intersectional trend, which has occurred across different countries and across different people. It is not something which is explicitly reduced or only occurs in the West or other countries around the world. It is something which translates geographical and societal boundaries. So at the end of this speech, I, oh, at the end of our case, we'll prove a couple of things to you. Firstly, this has resulted in a broad and widespread loss of meaning for individuals in society. And second, this has corrupted societies at a macro level more broadly, and that is something that we ought to regret. I think the counterfactual world that we stand behind is one where things like financial crashes are less likely to happen, ones where humanity is more likely to be able to interrogate claims that people made in the political or other spheres, and the humans have a greater sense of fulfilment because they ask the questions which strike at the heart of their being as opposed to what is best for corporations. So, secondly on the educational mechanism. Firstly, note that studying humanities shapes the parameters of your thought, or studying any degree more broadly shapes the parameters of your thought. That's to say that it's very hard to understand the arguments, for example, in feminism, if you do not engage with that in a critical or analytical sense through your degree. That's to say that if you study only economics, you probably have an anchoring bias where you largely perceive everything in terms of economic value, as opposed to other arguments or other forms of constructive engagement. But secondly, note it teaches you to think in a specific way. If you're studying hard sciences, everything is largely black and white to you and can be reducible into the scientific method. That is something which does not occur when you study a humanities degree because critical thought and, anal and analysis is inherent and intrinsic to that degree. I think it's yeah. important because your brain is programmed in a neurological way to look at things in certain ways or at the very least try to translate them into the sphere of thinking which you have been taught in your degree. But note that thirdly and very importantly that these things are zero sum at the point at which not every university has unlimited budgets or for example that private universities may, may be created, which unfortunately means that they will not be created in other areas. So obviously a tech college is more likely to exist in the status quo, yeah, as opposed to a humanities college, I'll take you in a moment, because that is something which is zero-sum, because there's not enough, there is finite capital, yes, close. I would love to hear what meaning Derrida gives you that money and actually the ability to shape your life as you want to does not give you when you run computer science, per se. I, I'm unclear exactly what that point means, but I think I think I do generally understand, and that's to say that when you do humanities, you have a broader skill set which can be applied to a 
even a finite area. So look at all the people who study philosophy, who then go on to run a hedge fund, but if you, if you study pure macroeconomics or microeconomics, you don't have a broader sphere of thinking. That's to say that we treat and give people a broader range of skills as opposed to a more narrow skill set, which can only be applied in the system which has been created and fostered by this, this as it has been created. So, next, let's talk about how this harm individuals. The first thing to say is that human humanity and human existence is something which is necessarily confronting. That's to say that the question of where meaning of life comes from is not something which we actually know the answer to, and that helps your consciousness. And at an individual level, reading Plato or Kant or the arguments of philosophers through time, and looking at artwork uh, forces you into a parameter where you think more about these critical issues and that you consider them in a, in a more deeper sense. Secondly, before I do that, I'll take the second POI from Moji. So, questions like, uh, why are we here? How many generations have asked that question to saturate the answer? Yeah, but, uh, like, look at the first generation that asked it, and look at the generations now. The point is that it's an iterative, iterative process where we oh, build yeah. on knowledge. Maybe we don't get the answer of the meaning of life. That wasn't our burden to prove in this debate. But we probably get closer than we do on your side. The second thing in that way it harms individuals is humanity teaches you to open your mind. Firstly, explicitly, in the way it teaches you critical thinking skills. And secondly, implicitly, in the way it teaches you to look at arguments in a rational or constructive sense. The impact there is clear, that individuals in society today are more egotistical when they do not pursue humanities degrees, which is good for them in the short term in the way in which CG wants to prop, or CO wants to prop, but it's bad for you in the long term in the way in which side government wants to stand behind. That is to say that in their world they have to stand behind a, a lack or a lesser sense of intrinsic fulfilment, and that is problematic. The third thing that I want to say is the way this impacts path dependency. So, as I've already iterated in that re uh, POI response, you have more flexibility when you engage with the humanities, than you do when you retire to a corporate finance degree, the way in which that occurs under the status quo. First in terms of literal, literal qualification, and secondly in terms of doing what you're told. So, briefly I want to talk about society which we expanded upon at second. Firstly, note that this ignores, you, you're more likely to ignore the social implications of your actions because you're more likely to grow up in a frame of mind which is predominantly based around self-interest and you do not care about collective action problem or any other higher order view of morality. But secondly, and importantly, this changes the way that the voting system works because mechanistically, you no longer value ideals like democracy because they are merely ideals and it's hard to quantify them in a purely financial sense through very practical votes. Uh, thanks to the Prime Minister, we'll have the League of Opposition. Yeah. Why do we exist was answered in different way in different century, yes. When in first century there was people asking why do we exist, it was answered well, maybe we exist to appease God and that's why we see Christianity came into existence in fifth century, Islam came into existence. You move on to 16th century, people say, oh we exist to remove class differentiation. And then now we say we are existing to appease our self-individualism. We say in Japan the answers have been different because the standard of living of these individuals have been different and the economic conditions and prosperity have been different at different times. The ability when you go ahead and see that I have an ability to go ahead and change my own might and own fate, in those cases you go ahead and change the, you try to change your fate on your own and you move towards individualism. What do I mean? The core to moving towards a better answer is only when you go ahead and move towards a world where you have a better standard of living for all and that's not something that you have towards more history, History measures are a whole, whole new level of you know philosophical measures, but maybe we will go ahead and bite the bullet and say yes with more economics measure. We see this in a world with trade off. Sit down, sir. With a world with trade off, where we have to go ahead and choose in between either a world with more philosophy majors or humanities major in between and versus a world where we see that more people are pursuing more mathematical or intuitive or deductive sciences. We will go for that. Why do we think so? Because understand this. 
the number of warfare has actually decreased over time as we have moved more towards economic and scientific prosperity because of the fact that when you go towards more humanitarian or humanities in general we are seeing in history how history has been a divisive point when there is a difference of opinion people go for war on the grounds of history we see ladies and gentlemen when you go for cultural identification there is a more ground for polarization and therefore philosophical polarization which we see is a ground for more wars at the end of the day when you look at it that markets are the solution to less war. Markets are the solution to go ahead and ensure that there is less poverty at the end of the day. When it is as such, it is something that we must realize. That a country with the best philosophers and best historians once collapsed, and that country's name is Soviet Union. And where else we see, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, the country, when you ensure that there are markets who are out there catering to a certain extent to these people, to, to, to the mathematical and, and the scientific analysis, those are directly related to increasing standard of living of people, eradicating poverty, and ensuring market-based solution where people are not required to take stipend from governments, which you might be student might be saying, but rather people are required to work for what they are, improve the market so that they're pro-poor, henceforth ensure that the livelihood they are into are much more skewed, are, are more inclusive market systems. We say this, those are something that are directly results of economic analysis that have been made by uh, by over the years, many, many generations of economics, especially in the recent times. Yes. Do you think that there is any potential harm to entire societies misunderstanding historical narratives, particularly historical narratives that apply to groups that have suffered genocides, slavery, mm -hmm. or other massive harms? Of course, there are a couple of responses to that. One, the fact that you go ahead and say that there are polarizing historical narratives is more relatively true when people take derivation and inspiration more often from history. So for example, when you go ahead and see that when Weimar Republic was constantly looking at their downfall in First World War, is where they go ahead, the historians were at a very good age of you know, thriving, more and more people writing history and philosophy, and the polarization point and more and more books being written upon was about history and why Weimar Republic failed. Secondly, when you go ahead and see that right now more and more people are being required to focus on the fact that, well, I understand the history, and maybe yes, I'm not saying that history should absolutely be eradicated, but the question is, what should we focus more given the limited resources? Well, if there are more books upon and more discussions upon, okay, fine, I realize that there is like the low-income uh, low community, how do we ensure that they have some level of livelihood which can ensure that they can have some level of income? Is it through government stipend or is it through ensuring that they have better jobs? or their ability to create more livelihood for themselves. These are the questions which specifically are derived through economic mathematical uh, models, which have over time have seen in China and many other parts of the world have eradicated millions, millions of people out of poverty. Yes. The entire case confuses correlation with causation. The question is what economic incentive exists to maintain the study of ancient cultures and languages on your side of the Exactly, house. for a couple of reasons. One is that you realize that our burden is not to ensure that there is any incentive at all for this side of humanity uh, to exist at all. But secondly, in a world where there is a trade-off existing, which world do we go for and which world do we prefer? In a world where we see that economics and you know, hard sciences are, are you know, diseases being eradicated through medical sciences, in that sort of a world is significantly better even if we have certain degree of, uh, a certain degree of less resources being allocated to history. Where we see, ladies and gentlemen, the current problems, for example, global warming, or problems which directly affect us in terms of sea level rise, is something that cannot be solved through humanities or be solved through other sorts of philosophies or history. Yes, maybe they can have some level of maybe contribution, but the larger hard science is actually required to ensure that how do you go ahead and bring drastic changes in terms of the level to be decreased. We believe, ladies and gentlemen, we would rather see that in a world where we see that market-based solutions or like polarization are taking place, we see that, yes, maybe somewhat in theoretical prospect, if you go ahead and fund a little bit of humanities, you can theoretically say, yes, people will be much more aware of what are the actual contexts of history and, and philosophy, and therefore you can say that right to right wouldn't have happened if there was more funding for philosophy and history. But guess what? In a world with some more emphasis on history and, of, and philosophy. It is more likely that there is polarized opinion, which I said in my first, first minute. And that's what we bank upon is the greatest harm that we see in terms of people more moving towards humanities. We think that at the end of the day, the subjective study of history or humanity is something that does not look to a conclusive evidence or conclusive answers, and rather leads to more and more sort of polarized answer, where people on one side say something, and the people on the other side say something, and cannot reach a 
conclusive opinion at the end of the day and the residual of that discussion eventually leads to more people still remaining hungry and more people at the end of the day in their air conditioned room are discussing oh was that historically even properly biased or not or was that historically even right or not we believe that that sort of polarization only ensures that there are more armchair researchers out there trying to talk about what they feel about certain particular level of historical or philosophical ending or opinion we say that those are, we are okay with less of such armchair historians and anthropologists and instead we are rather happy with those people who are rather trying to go ahead and look into the basic problems that are out there, trying to solve them. Yes, maybe a few of them can try to still be armchair philosophers, but at the end of the day we need more of the people and more resources being going ahead and solving the problems that are on the field of the people eradicating poverty. We say that that's a better world at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day we would have less diseases, more economic prosperity and no global warming maybe. Thank you. taking degrees that weren't arts focused degrees. Because their case without mechanisms relies upon empower the empowerment of the global poor through economics degrees and elite institutions. That's the massive flaw under this side today. Because it has been the wealthy that have transitioned from doing degrees focused on philosophy, on art, towards economics and science. And what have they promoted, speaker? A narrative of neoliberalism that has told you that yes, economically and mathematically, this pursuit is correct, it is justified, it is numerically true, to open markets, to change societies. The problem with that is that the lack of interrogation of an ethical basis has been concentrated in that particular individual group. So, their case relies upon arguing that the global poor have been empowered through this trend. Our case is simple. That individuals who are wealthy, who are elite, have rigged the game in their own favour and have had no counterbalancing push of ethical, moral or artistic considerations that have declined under this side. The first question I want to ask is how does this affect the individual? The most important premise we set under side government is that we need to promote individual happiness. And we gave you a clear narrative that individuals, even when pursuing high paid jobs, have a feeling of a loss of meaning. Because after 20 years of earning a whole lot of money, they have no family to spend it on, or if they do, they don't understand why they're pursuing their job, what it actually means. Opposition strawmans that by saying, we haven't figured out the meaning of life. But the problem was, as Stuart told you, is these degrees teach you critical thinking skills that allow you to evaluate, am I living a happy life? What are the alternative pursuits? Is my job problematic? Am I contributing to social and economic inequalities? Am I doing hobbies or things outside of my life that make me happy? For example, the study of art allows you to appreciate things like art that are not included within the realm of this particular thing. So all that meant was that studying philosophy, etc., didn't give you an absolute and very scientific understanding of the way life will operate, but it allowed you to self-reflect and decide what ought to make me happy with a critical and analytical framework that you couldn't have under their side. Because their side had, as Stuart told you, a degree of path dependency. You studied economics, you studied sciences, you pursued that path with absolutely no critical faculties or capacities to investigate beyond that because you only had a scientific or numerical frame. That was so important because at this point in the debate, it actually doesn't matter if they get more money. It doesn't matter if they prove their burden, they get way more people employed, way more in satisfaction in this job market. Because even if they do that, we tell you there is a broad trend of individuals being unfulfilled, being unsatisfied. And the causal mechanism of that is a cultural decline and a moral decline. And people do not consider what their lives are worth or why they are living in the first place. And that is so important for our case. Because if we win that, we win the debate. Because no matter what they prove under their side, they cannot prove that money makes you happy if it only leads to the kind of sadness that a neoliberal framework actually does. But the second burden they just refuse to prove, note that I am a responsive speaker and I don't get the chance to respond to their DOL, so that's problematic for their case, is they never establish why people studying economics led, first of all, the kind of people who are suffering inequality to get jobs, and second of all,
minimal leg to overall expansion. What am I going to show you? Firstly, people who did philosophy degrees previously are now doing economics degrees. So even if it's true accepting their premise that you get more money, those individuals are getting the money. Note the current status quo problem of a concentration of wealth in the 1%. If individuals who are elite are now studying economics degrees or mathematics degrees rather than arts degrees, they become wealthier, more prosperous. They have a knowledge advantage, so they can rig the game, they can rig markets, they can change the way, as Stuart told you, corporate capture operates to advantage themselves. That is so important, because what it means is that it is not, it's benefiting some people, but it is benefiting a few to the harm of the many, because now they don't have a chance to have class mobility. Classes are ossified and there is no capacity to actually enrich yourself. But secondly, and importantly, they never actually established why that led to benefits to the particular individuals. We told you it was a market, and that even more people got economics degrees. It actually probably made you depress the wages and depress values, because there are more competition in the supply side of that particular market. No proof under their side of why you actually got economic benefit, given that was the only premise of their case in our comparative, that is devastating for side opening opposition. So now I'm going to do some preemptive weighing, and do some explanation of why it harms societies, but firstly, yes. You can talk only about the 1% when you talk about the rates of the entire population who study a certain area, and especially in the cases where in the last few decades more and more poor no, people have started learning those first, things too. incorrect premise, many people don't go to university. Second premise, if you're poor under the status quo previously, you always are forced to go into vocational degrees because you had the pressure to do this under the status quo. That's important, Speaker, because the global poor never did a BA if they were in terrible circumstances, right? They would always go into functional degrees. This trend has affected the middle to upper classes. That was the context of our Case, because those are the only people who could transition from doing economically minded, sorry, from doing BAs to economically minded degrees, because you never had the poorest individual going to Yale and studying philosophy in that world anyway, speaker. That's a ludicrous premise. So, the preemptive way in here is that no matter what they prove, they're not going to be able to establish speaker under their side why society has become richer and happier. The trend is clear. Our argument is it's a clear and powerful narrative that as neoliberalism has increased, people being forced into job markets, they have taken things away from them that have made them objectively happy. Studying arts and studying social phenomena. I'm now going to go to my second issue, given that is in of itself debate with it, to explain how it has rigged and altered societies and the way it has been devastating for so many individuals. So, the, fir and, oh, the final thing there is you actually can learn other paths. So there's flexibility in the sense you can go into a financial job and be taught on the job, or you can learn sciences with a master's degree. So it's not mutually exclusive, but your side never can have philosophy study look at the motion because you're regretting the decline of those studies. We have our cake and eat it too, you get absolutely nothing under your side. Societies, how does it affect them? The biggest harm we're going to bring to you, Speaker, is the fact, so the best push is you can do things like eradicate diseases, etc., when you study the sciences. The first thing we tell you is that the premise of our case is that even if you're doing all these beneficial things, if they're rigged towards you know, the elites in the West, and not helping people who are in disadvantaged circumstances, we'd rather less, but more evenly distributed. And the premise of here is given at Stewart, which is, when you study ethics, look at the fact that you understand maybe it is wrong to oppress certain classes. Something you don't see in a meritocratically focused science or mathematical degree. And they might say, is that marginal enough? But the point is you have absolutely no pushback under your side if you're a global elite. But if you study Kantian ethics, if you believe in the kind of moral ethical claims, you're relatively more likely to sacrifice your own self-interest. That's what Stuart told you, is that societies are rigged now towards more individualism and more toxic competition. Because you have no pushback or comprehension of the ethics of what you're actually doing. The second thing we told you is that voting changes. Firstly, you strip funding away from the kind of studies that we're talking about because you don't actually appreciate them. That's devastating because we told you at Stewart, these are so important for preserving cultures, preserving language, preserving morality. That declines under your side of the house. And also voting writ large because you don't have critical thinking skills. The final thing we'll tell you is that historical narratives are way more powerful and way more toxic under this side. Because what they say is, well, you don't learn about history. The point is that you believe misnomers about history when you don't study it. So you're more likely to mislead people that Hitler didn't do X or terrible victims within the world did certain things they didn't actually do when you're historically comprehended. That is why you should vote prior position and you should definitely vote against opposition practice advice. Um, we'll have the deputy leader of opposition. Okay. Before I go on to my constructors, I have some thoughts on the previous speech, correct? 
I think the government hangs their hat on a corporate conspiracy theory on how the wealthy don't want you to learn humanities or get humanities degrees because that's the only way you can criticize corporations, the only way you can criticize governments. I'm telling you, entire revolutions and social changes have occurred outside of the academic ambit of humanities degrees where people understand what their needs are and what their rights are. They demand these things, they want to move forward like economically, they want to get like better solutions to diseases and things like that and that's how they overthrew governments and they brought down corporations and things like that. Not inside this little like air-conditioned academic bubble where you like discuss the meaning of life. Alright, moving forward. Economic benefits. What tiny western bubble does government live in that they think the hard sciences and economics of scale etc. have not increased the standard of living across the world? We're talking about billions of people lifted out of poverty and into prosperity or at least into a significantly, standard, significantly better standard of living due to the operation of new markets, due to hard sciences you know, curing diseases like polio, malaria, etc., due to innovation of things like, you know, uh, genetically modified food, foodstuffs, etc. All of these have massively increased the standard of living of millions, billions of people, you know, in India, in China, in Bangladesh, in South Asia, in Africa, etc. And the massive social mobility, which includes our families, by the way, well, that, that has occurred where these individuals who are locked into, you know, gener intergenerational poverty and intergenerational debt to like feudal lords and things like that, sort of that have got to move on and have got to like participate like in education, things like debate tournaments and things like that, which are particularly more important. The benefits of these blow the benefits of humanities out of the water. I'll take care of a bit later. All right, yeah. moving forward. I think the scope of expansion for economics and scientific questions is significantly greater than that of the humanities. As we move forward in life, we need to ask ourselves, how do we feed 7 billion people? A lot more important than why do 7 billion people exist, or why do each of us exist in this planet? See, that question has been answered intergenerationally, and the answer is pretty saturated anyways, regardless of like what some, some subjective opinions might be. What my question is a hard question that will exist forever, and will always have to be answered, and will always require more innovative answers, and will affect the lives of far more people. I'll take the lower first. Okay, so, is it the case is it the position of side opposition that the entire decline, or that most of the decline of people that have left the humanities have gone to take on scientific jobs in the fields they have gone to study in other topics in the aggregate, or do you think that there might be an oversaturation? Uh -huh. I'm not in a position to answer that question, firstly. And secondly, more importantly, it doesn't necessarily have to be that it's been replaced by science. I'm talking about the importance of science uh, and the greater importance of science in both the problems of the now and the problems of the future and why they matter more. All right, yeah. moving forward. Understanding that this answer here is when we get uh, your best case scenario is that you get a little bit closer to understanding like maybe our existential dread or loneliness and things like that. We get closer to un answering how are we going to cure cancer? How are we going to create the next massive genetically modified food that's going to feed like billions of people in China and Africa and India, Bangladesh, etc. In, in, in a way that can be sustainable and, they can, and that can be grown. See, the more uh, you know, re re research we have in, the, in these fields and the more de degrees people get, the more money gets poured into these, directly correlate to the kind of benefits that I'm talking about under our world. As opposed to the more money that goes into your fields, do not have anything near these kind of benefits, and that's why we're far more important within this debate. Understand that there's no real explanation coming from you guys as to how these humanities degrees, etc., will help these people understand or, or better better rein in the excess of capitalism or rein in the excess of like neocolonialism, globalism, etc. Okay, so we can have a significantly better understanding, or maybe a slightly better understanding, of history or of or, or, or of like systems of moralities by which we are being screwed over. But understand more importantly, when it comes to things like globalism, when it comes to things like you know uh, capital, capitalism, and politics, etc., being right means nothing compared to having the resources and having the capacity to stand up for yourself and being able to make your demands and getting what, what you what you are, are owed and getting your rights and things like that. Understand in your world, what's going to happen here is that we're going to have a slightly better idea of why we're here but we're still taking orders from our white western masters and that's not acceptable to us. The only way for us to like go up to a point where we can demand all the things that we, we, we are owed comes a, a, extremely from you know establishing oh, these right. material stuff. A little bit later. All right, try and understand that regarding global war and conflict, 
Like coming from a post-conflict society, such as Bangladesh, the obsession with genocide or the understanding of these genocides and like historical states, etc., are pervasive throughout society. And this is true of many other societies as well, you know, like societies in Africa, some societies like India and Pakistan, societies in the Middle East, such as like Palestine, Israel, etc. Understand that these things, understanding our oppression, understanding our oppressor, did not necessarily get us any closer to a peace, more peaceful coexistence and did not get us any closer to, uh, to properly questioning our governments, properly uh, questioning corporations, etc., and things like that. What ha actually happened there was that this obsession with the past and like the, 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 these jingoistic and nationalistic sentiments only made us accept nationalistic government, or autocratic governments, na nationalistic narratives, etc., and not question the way in which we were being screwed over by our own governments and not make those demands. It's only forward thinking about the requirements that we have, irrespective of those is is historic issues, that we uh, actually managed to uh, you know, demand better from governments and get better things from governments. I'll take another for lower if you have one. Okay, so do you think that it might be useful that people value certain things like gender studies degrees, especially when concepts like affirmative consent are laughed at and literally made fun of on Saturday Night Live and other topics? I, 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 I would never belittle the importance of affirmative consent and other things like gender studies do come, come into question. I'm saying that they're in no way more important than the ability for a person to feed his family or the ability for, for our community to like eliminate something like polio, etc. I would argue that on a hierarchy of needs, while it's very important to have those things as well, it's only once we establish the basic needs that our people are more receptive to understanding these questions of like, you know, affirmative consent, and only then can you get like community buying into questions like affirmative consent and things like that, and you're not going to get it under your world unless you, you know, further our world forward first. But understand this, what I was saying was, regarding uh, historical narratives, where there has been a significant amount of already understanding of what history is and, uh, and history has been put forward. But they haven't necessarily allowed us to move forward. They've had us arguing over the past for or distracting from the real questions of where our motivation should come from. And the motivation should come from the future. We should be more united, or even if we are divided, it would be divided over the question of how to solve these problems in the future, such as like land or like you know existence, medicine, etc. Not considering the things that divide in the past. For all these reasons, we're very proud to us. No, that that looks like a net. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Like, let's call it. Let's call it. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Um, you may want to check if the heat's on over there, above you. Oh, it looks like it is from a distance. Oh, that. Yeah. You think it's like the top? Is it? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe yeah. let's 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 get going with the MG. Um, I just turned it off. Sweet. Okay. Um, um, great. Um, we'll have the member come. Okay. Oh. It seems that in this round, both two teams in the front half agree that social utility is something uh, that's inherently valuable. So what we're going to do on, so on CG is to prove to you why we do get important social utility and social discussions out of the learning of humanities. And we're also going to talk to you how that increases the range, uh, range of choices available to students who already have their interests pretty formed. Um, and I think most of the reputation will be integrated. Uh, okay. So, intrinsic value of humanities. I think OG uh, largely rests on the idea that individual happiness and uh, the existential dread is something that you are able to uh, have a better understanding of if you do a humanities degree. I think that the benefits of humanities degree is a lot wider than that. I think that because society tends to value higher education as, a, as an institution that propagates ideas that say what type, sure. of, import, what type of social narratives are important are, are things that we need to discuss, right? So I think that when people think that gender studies is something that only like 
uh, like women who are extreme or uh, is, is a subject that's not, that's not worth learning, then essentially as a society you're also saying that these, thing, these narratives themselves are not important, that discussions around gender equality, around like affirmative, uh, like affirmative consent policies are not important. That's why these things were laughed at the very beginning. I also think that also bleeds in, uh, in subjects like political science because people being able, people being interested in political science, in learning, in like participating in uh, like civic duties is something that's in general of high uh, like of high value to the society. It's not just a type of like medicine and law and economics that they want to talk about. And also in terms of historical narratives that already exist, right? Uh, that are not getting corrected. I think that when you only have a few people who are uh, like in the high academic chamber who are able to discuss those narratives, then necessarily the narratives will proceed. People will think that uh, like say capitalism is something that they need to uh, need to live with. That's uh, that's the flaws of capitalism are something that's really inherent in what they have to live by, and I think that that's a world where you get less challenge and less change. Um, but also on top of that, just to clash with some some of the idea that came from OO, uh, the idea you know uh, a lot of things uh, because they basically rest their case on this idea that you know you need to establish yourself materially before you are able to critique those ideas and participate in social narratives. I think that's just not true. If you're relying on people being able to already be very materially well off before they can participate in important discussions, I think that's just locking out a lot of people out of discussions, out of like the like lock them like not recognizing their voice to begin with. Recognize quite often in a capital in a capitalist world, no matter how much capitalist philanthropy you can do, in the end you will always have people that are relatively that are comparatively le less well off. And I think that the solution for them is not necessarily to say that they can go that they go that they just like go to college and magic um, uh, like uh, for like some kind of STEM degree and like uh, all of a sudden become better off themselves. I don't think that's necessarily the solution. Um, and also they talked about the idea, you know, creating, uh, a, 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 you know, like you get less conflicts when you have uh, when you have markets because uh, presumably markets have an incentive to uh, to for people to work together uh, as a uh, as opposed to fight each other. I think that um, like that's it's not a problem about whether people are uh, whether people are like co collaborating. It's a problem where this collaboration process within capitalism that's also a process that like take like extracts uh, like economic value from people that are less able to participate in that in that uh, in that system that are less able less systematically disadvantaged, right? So I think that when you have uh, no like no one with a like in like say bioethics and like uh, bio, like bioethics, those type of science subjects that you want to talk about, or like uh, ideas about privacy for like big firms like Facebook, right? Recognize we do achieve progress, but at the same time, we just don't get criticism and don't get corrections of inherent problems of the system that we're living in. And I think that's pretty bad. Recognize the comparative in this debate, though, is not a comparative between whether you have only science degrees or whether you have only humanities degrees. The motion that we need to, that, that we're, we're regretting is that fewer people are choosing humanities degrees, are devaluing humanities degrees. Um, before I move on to talk more, I should probably take a few why. Yes. Who is more capable of resisting autocratic governments and capitalism? People who have uh, their own understanding of capitalism and their own capital with which to make these sort of like uh, arguments, or people who okay, I think it's it's like very condescending for them to say that you actually need like like you can only you can only be able to understand challenges you face and, uh, and these problems and have those discussions uh, once you are materially well off. I think people do have a good idea of it. It's just that these ideas are not are not seen as important. These challenges not seen as important because act, because like higher institutions are like devaluing. Uh, devaluing these ideas and discussions. Um, also, so uh, moving on, right? Like recognize both two sides, uh, like uh, like I think that on both two sides there will be people that are able to attend higher education. Uh, the decline that's actually happening from uh, from people that choose humanities are people that who, who can't afford humanities. And I think that uh, like when like the problem the problem with this is that um like because like humanities are devalued, you are also living in a world where like after getting a humanities degree, you are getting less rewarded. You're getting paid less. Like you are seen as someone who's like like off less economic value than someone else. And I think that just like leads to like even less and less participation in this. Given that a lot of people, I think people's interest in things is not necessarily making an interest at the point before entering college. I think a lot of people in the past in the past past like few decades, I would say like the number of people interested in humanities versus like probably 
probably haven't changed much. But yeah. what have changed is that when like these people are told that they need to go to STEM, uh, like STEM field or science field in order to make more money, uh, I'll, I actually have to take you. Yes. Yes. So if you're stuck in debt for all of your life because you studied philosophy and has no job, what sort of change in your life or in the society can you do? I think that like it's not about it's not about direct changes as to like re revolutionizing science or whatever. We talked about how you how you start uh, like like so like how participating in social narratives, right? And I think that the the idea that higher education values philosophy as a discipline is something that's important to giving credit to those social discussions to begin with. Um, also, uh, and I think the the flip the, the other side of that is also people that are intrinsically interested in science degrees are intrinsically interested in degrees that make money are not less capable of going to those degrees to begin with. The reason for that is because there is, is now a race to bottom to like to to like obtain like a STEM degree, a science degree, because that's presumably like what every other competitive person is doing. Like, do you necessarily need to have like a plus of like a like a bio of every biochem course in order to go to just a middle or her uh, med school and do well as a doctor? I do not think that's necessarily true. But that type of race to bottom is fundamentally just crowding like those fields with more uh, with more talent, with more competition, uh, and end up like increasing the cost of uh, education for everyone who are indeed interested in those fields. Um, uh, based on all these reasons, I'm very troubled. Thank the member of government. I think everyone on the panel is ready. We'll have the member of opposition here. Yeah. Day who have a uh, huge students loans that they cannot actually bring back. They claim for uh, years and years, uh, giving most of their salary back to the university just to pay for them the goods. We see that even the people who loans today, humanities, are in the world in the worst position to actually pay for the huge loan and huge uh, uh, responsibility they took by taking all of that money. We think that if we would see 40 or 50 percent of people learning humanities like in the in the graph, we think that there will be so many people. Most most of them from the best uh, uh, socio-economical uh, area would, would be in this kind of, uh, in this problem in those debts, and their life would just be bad. Secondly, we just uh, um, we see that uh, 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 on the other side, we see that the people from minorities, from a uh, bad socio-economic area, who, who took uh, uh, the better, the degrees that gave them a, st a steady job, that gave them more money, now are the force that actually make the change in our society because they put the money and give it to lobbyists who go to actually changing laws that will change their life. Because they are role models, make other people look at them and say, yes, a minority uh, can be uh, as a good citizen that uh, uh, helps us. We think that that is the real way to actually change the world, and that would be my uh, three points. First of all, why uh, uh, um, more people to take humanity will actually make a lot of people bad, bad uh, and poor life. Secondly, why uh, uh, it is better that minority will actually uh, will uh, or, or people with liberal uh, views will learn uh, uh, will learn, um, studies will give them more money and actually influence on the society. And thirdly, we think that humanity doesn't really change a lot of minds today, okay, or at all. Uh, look, before that. Um, let, let's talk. The, the main idea that we get is that people doesn't uh, criticize neo capitalism and they think that every, that every liberal idea is just bad and, and madness. Have you ever seen any kind of discussion, even on Facebook, on YouTube, on a political party on the street? People have criticized it everything. In today's world, it's so easy to go and learn and have any, a, a, a very easy and convenient way to learn and see criticism about every idea that you can't actually sh uh, say out loud any kind of idea without 10 people showing you why that's uh, wrong. We think that today's world, you don't need to have five years or four, three years of learning of old Greeks in order to have a criticizing that it's actually relevant to the actual idea of political views that uh, uh, the government does. We think that it happens a, a, a lot more than before. Why? Because the, the, the university is so bad at criticizing and actually changing people's mind next to what we already have in the free, in the free market of ideas today. Right, right. So let's talk about, yes, 
The problem with the entirety of the bench is that you fail to realise that the decline of humanities is symmetric to societal decline, not a response to it. Critiquing well is very different to just critiquing. I didn't understand what you said, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I hope my points will answer that. Look, why, uh, why, look, as I told you, there's thousands of people who, uh, in, in order to learn uh, a degree, in most countries, you have to take a huge loan and pay and, and stop working for three or four years and just take all of your time and, and go to university. And we think that just by, because there is not so much people, uh, there's, the, the amount of jobs in economics, in law, in science is getting bigger every year, but the amount of jobs that you actually can work as a philosopher, as a historian, has stayed steady all, all this time. It means that we can't have jobs for all of those people who are going to learn the humanities. It means that they're going to waste three or four lives that year, that instead of get personal capital to actually get more money and actually change their life, they're just going to have huge debt that for years they have to pay it back. Why is that so bad? First of all, we just think that their life is going to be bad. Most of the people who are going to learn uh, humanities are going to have low wage uh, uh, works for their uh, whole life, and they are not going to be able to actually pay a lot of their debt, and it's just life will be bad. I think that is a huge harm that you have to uh, engage with in order to show why the amorphical change that you're talking about is that important. Secondly, we think that a lot of that is coming on the uh, um, is coming on minorities and people with uh, 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 from lower uh, economical background. Why? They, they told us, oh no, this debate is about here. What? Most of the students are not going to Yale, they're going to community college, they're getting affirmative action to go to the, the, the first university that we actually get them, they get scholarships to actually get them. We think that a lot of the people, more, the majority percentage-wise of people, are not the, the most rich, but the people who can actually afford, who just got the afford to be able to go to university. We think that a lot of them are people that after they're going to get this debt, they will not be able to actually pay it back without a big increase to their, uh, to their salary, and they and their family are going to pay for it for years to come. We just think this is a huge harm from those minorities. And more than that, we think that just because they'll have this burden, it will be a lot harder for them to change their life. On the comparative, let's say they learn a computer science degree, and now they have a, a, an engineer a, a salary, or a, a work in a big law firm that can actually change. First of all, we think that their life got better. We have people who are actually in the harm that we want to help them get their life get better. Secondly, they are getting more power. Their ability to actually enact of their belief. Let's Let's say I'm a part of a minority and I want to hire people of a minority just so they will get more chances because I think that there's a, 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 there's a, a, people don't do it enough. But I think I, I need to give people from lower income more chances. I can actually be the change that we want. And we don't think that you need to have a huge uh, humanity degree to understand that if there's a discrimination, you should hire more people from the uh, group who got discriminated. Those are the real changes in our life. Secondly, they are good role models. First, for their own kind, you can see here is a person who was the best of his class and he went to university and he has a better life. On the comparative, you have someone, the best from your class, who actually went to university and now he's poor and have to pay for all of the loans he took. Second. Okay. Part of this debate that you guys are ignoring is that a decline in the respect of humanities has also actually been coincided with a decline of employers for valuing these subjects and giving opportunities. First of all, the motion is not this, the house that regrets the, uh, the decline in the respect for humanities. We think that well, because those people are not going to get more money in, e in either world, people are still not going to hire them because they don't have the skills you need in order to have a good job who gets a lot of money from uh, 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 not like an engineer or from an economics or, uh, uh, or engineering uh, uh, that can actually do stuff that will uh, give you a lot of money. So this is going to happen anyway and they're still not going to have money and still not going to have respect. Lastly, let's talk about the huge idea, yes? Because as they told us, the, yes, you have to learn this in order to change uh, uh, the uh, society. We think that most people don't care about the critique that comes from the academia. Why? Because they talk high. They talk about Marx and, uh, and Marxism and, and Hegel. And a lot of uh, just words sound foreign. Secondly, they are a lot of uh, disconnected because they have tenure, because they are not in the field work, because they don't really understand the problem of the people. This is why we see Trump supporters go against the elite who tries to make us give more money to the black or Hispanics or minorities. We think there is actually a huge backlash against changes that try to come from the academia versus the changes to come from down within the people with the money that actually change their life. Because of all of those reasons, please oppose. Thank you very much.
thank the um, opposition member. We'll have the government whip. Yeah, yeah. greatest problems of the opposition case in this round is that there is a denial of any sort of practical benefit to humanities and the people that study these subjects, and how they might actually benefit not only the world, but specific kinds of pursuits that are necessary for not just utilitarian aims, but also for any pursuit of human happiness. So I'm going to talk about two things in this speech. First of all, why the, the, the humanities are valuable, and second, what trade-offs exist. But starting with why the humanities are valuable. Note that Ivy mentions in the extension that there are many different kinds of things that require people to be studied and learned in certain subjects in order for us to be able to have understanding that better informs policy. We get the example of political science. I would ask you, how many of you would be comfortable living in a country wherein people were not studying things like public policy to such a degree as to understand how, for instance, sociological impacts might occur in specific communities? These are things that get studied at universities in the humanities subjects. These kinds of things have massive, massive impacts on how different policies actually occur. The problem on side opposition is that all they want to talk about is as if the only thing that could possibly matter is that people are being hired for specific kinds of jobs and that material wealth only matters in certain circumstances. But I would note, there is no way to actually solve structural issues of accessibility and unfairness if you don't have people who are studying these subjects that are being given the accorded respect to be given paid positions, both by the government and in other areas of work. But the other even more problematic aspect here is that there's this weird assumption that by virtue of doing a scientific or non-humanities degree, that you gain something inherent that gives you some kind of skill that could not possibly apply if you did other kinds of learning. But this is sort of opposite of what we've learned about a lot of different kinds of fields. I point you to things like computer science, where people are able to go to two month coding camps and learn a lot of basic skills in a short amount of time, but then aren't necessarily able to, for instance, have different kinds of skills that employees value, like being able to show empathy or have an understanding of different sort of societal trends that might be valuable in a specific workplace. Also things like management skills, right? The ability to be able to know how to deal with other people and allow those individuals to interact in a cohesive way are things that are specifically studied in the humanities that are undervalued by side opposition. And I don't want to just say that that's just side opposition's fault. A big part of government's case, and this was first government too, give them credit for what they said, is that one of the really important things is that the decline, the decline of humanities has coincided with a decline of respect for how people view these kinds of subjects and the accordance of the value that they basically give to them. The impact that that has is that people are not willing to see these things as economically beneficial. The case of side government has been clear all along that in a society that had more people involved in the humanities and where th there would likely be a better representation of those subjects and people would respect them to a larger degree. Okay, what else is really important to mention in this debate? We also talked about historical narratives and social understanding. We get somewhat similar responses to this from both of the opposition teams. One of the first things that we get is the idea that studying these subjects doesn't actually lead us to any kind of tangible change. But there isn't, but besides just asserting this, I don't think that they ever actually refute the argument. I would suggest to you that it would, be, it would have been much more difficult for US historians to propagate the lie of the lost cause narrative if there was many more people in the United States that had historical literacy and an ability to engage in these ideas. We're not going to suggest that by people studying history, they're all going to come to the right conclusions. But what we do know about people who study in the humanities is that they are more likely to engage in a rigorous way in ideas that leads them less likely to buy bullshit. That's what we get on side government that doesn't occur on side opposition. The reason second opposition's Facebook example doesn't work is when people react to shit on Facebook, they are doing it not having actually spent a long time in most cases engaging with the practical concerns of the lost cause narrative or a long history of slavery and its impact on the US institutions that followed. That's just my personal opinion on why those things happen. Maybe second opposition agrees and that we're better living in a world where people don't understand those factors. I'd suggest that's a hard thing to prove. Uh, first, Gav. Yeah. 
First off, sorry. Yeah. All right. So I recognize the access to various solutions are, might be slightly better if you did understand the managing the arguments thereof. But those solutions exist in the first place specifically because the number of people who've been working the hard science in the economics to bring those you know, into existence. No, this is about volume. The more people that study these things, the more they talk about it, the more people they interact with, the louder these things become. We only get an actual societal importance and value of these things when people study them and they try to convince others that they matter. That's the only way that this occurs. If side opposition wants us to live in a world where people aren't studying these things, we don't get that level of importance. But I do want to move on to this question of what trade-offs exist in this debate. Because I think probably some of the most persuasive things that we get from side opposition are two things. First, the notion that we're going to get less scientific progress in research overall. And then secondly, from second opposition, the notion that material security is most important and that we must have people basically pursuing the path that would best lead them to get jobs that matter for them. I want to deal with scientific research First, one big problem with understanding the, the, this understanding of uh, about how people study things is that it misses out that the humanities and sciences often intersect. You don't get as much studying of things like bioethics or how to actually conduct ethical research in a world where the humanities is not actually emphasized. I fear to live in a world where we don't consider questions of what actually conducts ethical research as seriously because all people care is, as First Government says, about the card dollar ca like cause of what these things are going to do for a job. We need to actually have these sorts of ethical questions that are pursued. And I would also suggest to you that they never engage with our argumentation about saturation. They, all they say at one point is the absurd and like non-factual claim that, hey, all these lawyers' jobs are like rising all over the world, which like I don't know where they're getting their facts, but every Western country that I know of is having many, many more unemployed lawyers who are unable to get access to these jobs and are finding themselves having to work in other fields because there's way more competition than there was 40 years ago. But even if you ignore that question and there was some benefit to this idea of being able to get material security, again, this doesn't engage with Ivy's access accessibility argumentation. Ivy points out that the more people that are taking these kinds of subjects, whether it be engineering, medical science, economics, the more expensive these programs get and the harder it is to be able to get into these programs and be able to afford them. If you believe that that argumentation is true, then what you end up having is a situation where the loans that second opposition is so concerned about get massively higher and there is massively less likelihood of those people being able to get jobs to pay off the loans that side second opposition cares so much about. On our side of the house, humanities degrees are like seven times cheaper on aggregate than most of these other kinds of degrees and are much easier in many circumstances to be able to pay off even if you buy their binary proud shoe. And for the final speech in the sauna, we'll have the opposition. Yeah. studies were most powerful in the beginning of the 20th century and the late of the 19th century. Although in that society women were still oppressed massively. Although in that society the pools were in, most, in worse condition than they are in today. They were less acceptable in the US to talk about socialism as a whole. It was less acceptable anywhere in the world. We say that they say that humanities actually create a change but, uh, but they are not proving it at all. And we've actually given you the analysis of how it happens. We've told you that the humanities are still disconnected and are not creating this change. But actually what has happened? The women has gained power because they have gained, they have gained economic power during World War One. This is what causing the change. People get in wars, people get in political power because they can influence that, because people care about their position in the world. This is what we've proven you in second opposition, and this rebuts everything we hear from the government. And we talk about three main things. 
Firstly, an important point of context to this debate, changing a lot of what we heard until now. Secondly, I will mean, talk about the private person and what is better to the person who actually goes and study those stuff. And thirdly, we will talk about the changes in the society. So let's begin. So put context in this debate. So firstly, just to make sure, we are not talking about the changes in the biggest ideas. Those changes are happens from the geniuses, probably like those areas mostly anyway, and we go to study the things anyway. The new what? social things happens anyway because there are still, let's say, less people who study humanities, but still the people who are really passionate about it go to study humanities. And also on their side of the house, Einstein would have still gone and studied mathematics or physics because he would still very love those stuff. So secondly, so that just like framing that, secondly, where did the change happen? Because OG wanted to talk a lot about only the rich people changing and not studying humanities. humanities. This is not the case. Many people, even the poor one, has studied humanities be before them because like OG said in their prime minister's speech, right now there is a change to study what gives you money, but before that, that wasn't the case. This was the framing of prime minister, which means that also the poor people wanted to study before that, didn't do that only because of money and went to study those other things. This means that those poor people, as we've told you, has gone into larger debts, has lost many of their jobs, and this has been horrible okay. to them. Thirdly, let's talk about what is actually the humanities, because there is a lot of confusion in CG. They are talking about management skills, they are talking about policy studies. Those things are happening on our side of the house and not their side of the house. Actually, learning history is not going to make you study whether a certain policy is going to help a certain community or not. This is going to study how policy affects, which is not humanity, but social studies, okay. which are not in the humanities, read the info slide. So, okay, firstly, let's talk about the, like, the cost of getting into the profession, because there trying to tell us that in, like, in two months you can learn how to code. So firstly, this is not the case in the vast majority of our professions after that. But we actually tell you the opposite. Because today, incredible amount of people see YouTube videos, listen to lectures, and therefore the cost of getting the humanity studies that are enough to have enough critical thinking, enough of learning about new ideas in history, is much lower than before. That means that those ideas, which are not the most complex ones, are accessible today, and that changes a lot of what government are actually talking about. No, thank you. Let's talk about the private person. Because OG firstly likes to talk a lot about meaning. We like contradict that claim. Let's explain why. Firstly, I don't think that actually studying humanities give you meaning. We think there is a or Foucault that actually deconstruct the word meaning and what it is meaningful in society means that probably when you think a lot about how much life is meaningless, you are not feeling more meaningful. This is why we see there is actually much more depression in artists and philosophers because they think a lot of how much life is meaningless. We don't think they have proven anything in their point other than that. But what we have told you is that when people, what do they value the most mostly? Their family, their objectives in their career. We say that those things most people don't feel unvaluable after 10 years. They feel they have little children, they have the money to support them, their life is much more valuable and meaningful and this happens more when they have more money on our side of the house. Secondly, they tell you that it's actually helping the uh, helping you because you have more flexibility and it's critical thought. This is obviously been said by someone who never studies science. Because we say that you actually get a lot of critical thought while studying law, economy, or science, but actually you have to contradict the theories that happen today. We just don't get their analysis on why it changes on their side of the house. But what does happen? You have much less ability to be in a profession. Because you don't have the basic skills of working in that profession, other than if you would have studied that profession. Which means that it does change the fact to those people who did and study. So why did he begin you that? Because we've told you that what happens on their side of the house is that hundreds of thousands or even millions around the world of people are going to have studies, things that they don't have jobs at. They are trying to say that the society would have valued this differently. But there is actually no analysis there. We think that still banks would want people who are good with economy and banking. We still think technology companies would just not come up if there are new engineers that can do that, even if you study philosophy. So it means that those people are going to stay in debt. This is what is actually creating economical crises. This is what is creating a lot of unemployment in Europe that we see today. Those are the bad stuff that happens because people study those things. We say that this is horrible and need to be changed. Before that, OG. You are right the unique parts of safety extension are excluded in the motion. 
to respond to our case about philosophy and history and the fact that you can either choose to study postgraduate or learn the skills so on the job as financial burden. So we say when you study postgraduate, it's not an option when you're poor and have to work right now because you already wasted like three years of your life of studying something that does not help you to get job. We say that on the other hand, you get much more jobs and skills on our side of the house. So what CO tells you then? They tells you that it's hard to get a job in computer science because there are so many people studying it? No. This is why their wages are so high today because there are less Less engineers than what the rocket would have wanted to CG. Okay, do you think we need a historical understanding of events, for instance, in countries like Canada, Canada and Rwanda, to engage in things like truth and reconciliation commissions to actually achieve okay, peace in the aftermath? Let's, of let's go to the social things right now. Because what do we hear from them? People will value those things more and have more discussions of it. Firstly, we don't buy the premise of this case. What Amichai has told you is that when you go to the academy and stay there for years and being a professor in there, what happens is that you talk in a certain way. You say deconstructionism. You say that, like Hegel said those stuff. This is not what is convincing people. This is actually not what we've seen. For the last 150 years, what we have saw is that many smart people were in the academy, actually propagated bad stuff, like we heard also from all old, but we've told you that this does not actually make changes. This is also answering CG's point about the rich not wanting to be capitalist because they studied the humanity. They, they studied the humanity for the last 200 years and still wanted to be capitalist and still didn't want to help the poor. This is not what is causing that change. What we have told you is the changes are coming from below. The changes are coming where people have the money to make their ideas. This is what has created the Black Lives Matter. This is what has created the feminist people going to the streets and having riots. The fact that they had money, that political support, that only happens on our side of the house. Please. Okay, thanks everyone for the Yeah, we go. I think that's